Okay, this is the second lecture for chapter four. Um, excuse me, start on slide 25, for those of you who are following along in your slides. Uh, <clears throat> this chapter talks about global warming as a, as a key, uh, key theme, and it talks about electromagnetic radiation that comes into the Earth, and some of it leaves, right, about 46% uh, comes in and stays, and 54% gets bounced back out. Uh, and that's what keeps us warm. That's what keeps our, our average temperature around 15 degrees C, about 59 degrees F, year-round across the, across the globe. Now, there, there are natural greenhouse gases. That is a part of the process, okay? That is part of light. That's how, how nature has it. So nature has it where we have these greenhouse gases. Essentially, you can think of greenhouse gases as a big blanket around the Earth to keep it warm. So that's really what they, what they are. So they blanket the earth and they keep it warm. Now, one of the questions that comes up is how do we know that the gases were different uh, now than before? And that is what slide 25 teaches. Learning from our past ice core samples. I will tell you in advance now, this slide is absolutely always on my exams, no matter what. Okay? So, this is important. And... Because this answers the question that people ask, you know, about whether there really is global warming and how do you know, and scientists were not there when it happened, so how do they know? They know because at the polar caps, at the, their, the, the, world's, the world's frozen, and it's certainly frozen beneath the surface, and th there have been gases being trapped in the polar caps. You get it? Trapped in ice. So what happens is they dig these core, and that's what you're seeing on this slide, they dig these core samples from there, and within these core samples, we have these microscopic bubbles in there. And these microscopic bubbles from the glaciers contain the greenhouse gases. So they'll take these microscopic, they'll take these ice core samples, and they will analyze them using infrared. And if it's CO2, the infrared will look like this. This is a thumbprint of infrared. Okay, this is what it looks like. This is how uh, it absorbs and transmits. Uh, uh, it absorbs uh, light and transmits. Okay? So we have the uh, infrared radiation here for CO2. I'm sorry, infrared spectrum for CO2 here. And we have it for water. So these will be two gases. And again, this is a, it's like a thumbprint. Okay. I'm trying not to use the word fingerprint anymore because actually on an IR spectrum, there's a region specifically called fingerprint, and I want you to confuse the two. Okay. So I'm choosing now to use the term thumbprint. So we know this. So we, it stamps this is water. And so they pull these samples, take this sample, and put it in a spectrophotometer, and voila, they get the answer. And this is how they know that their gas, what the gases look like in the past. And the other part is to say, well, how do they know about the time period? Well, carbon has a radioactive signal, C13. That is one of its isotopes. We studied about isotope in the first lecture. You have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-13 tends to have a, a well-defined half-life. And because of that well-defined half-life of its radioactive isotope of C13, we can determine the age of carbon species. Does everyone follow? So the combination of that science tells us what we, what we got from the past. And so when scientists looked at this data, again, using IR and other methods, and again, solid samples from... Uh, Antarctica and a few other places around the globe, they discover the following that when they look at samples that were dated around 1750, the carbon dioxide level was as shown on this diagram. Okay? And so shown in green is carbon dioxide. And shown in this orange color is, uh, uh, yeah, the NOx. Let's see. 
No, methane. Yeah, methane shown the orange color, and shown the bottom red color, the NOx. And these are in you know, a and we've talked about NOx, right? And so the discovery is that if you look at the trend line, this line was pretty pretty level, and we suspect it's been level for a, for a long time, and maybe a slight incline. But right about after about 1850, certainly around the 1900s, notice what happens to the slopes. They start to slope up, and this is a pretty rapid rate, for those of you who understand the math part of it. This is pretty, pretty steep, and if you don't understand math, you've got to see that's kind of taking a curve, right? And that's going up a lot faster. This is how they know we're putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Keep in mind, nature had already had itself balanced in how to keep us warm at approximately 15 degrees C, 59 degrees F around the world. But this addition of greenhouse gases has pushed the temperature up. And that rise in temperature, if you, pull, if you overlay the rise in temperature, it matches well with the rise in these greenhouse gases. That's how we know that's happening. Now, what do we know? I'm, sh every, I'm sure you guys are, is there any, are there any freshmen in, in, in my class? Freshmen? Oh, lots of freshmen. Okay. Well, if you, you've at least taken history somewhere, right? Yeah, right. If you've ever taken history, you kind of know what started to happen right around this era between the 1900s and 1950. Yep, that great old, what? Industrial Revolution. We started to make machines, iron horses, right? This is what started to happen. So as, industrial, as industrialization started coming, and after the 1950s, now you get into the region here where vehicles are starting to be, be manufactured. And so that's putting more materials in the air. So manufacturing, so it, uh, manufacturing the, the rise in manufacturing is directly proportional to these data. So if you overlay uh, increase in manufacturing output, it shows a trend. If you overlay temperature rise, it follows the same trend. And these greenhouse gases, it follows the same trend. All by combining the core data that they found and looking at the concentrations, it's clear that there is an increase in um, greenhouse gases. Okay, And we know that these gases are responsible for the blanket, for keeping the earth warm. And this is important and a critical, a critical piece to understand. So, to repeat that in a little bit of a summary fashion, uh, application of natural greenhouse gases. There are more. CO2 contributes to elevated global temperature. We know that. That is that's that's well documented, well proven science. The concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has been increasing over the past century. We know that. More industrialization. The increase in atmospheric CO2 is a consequence of man's activity. Man's activity is making cell phones, vehicles, nylons, tennis rackets. Okay? That's what is that's jewelry, all these things. If it's made, if it's manufactured, in some way it is very likely contributing to, to this. So for those who say you should just stop driving your vehicle, people who enjoy driving vehicles will say you should stop buying so many cell phones. You get it? But manufacturing contributes to it. All right? The average global temperature has increased over the past century. That is documented. I expect you to understand and know these, these trends and know why. So we look at prediction in the future. Carbon dioxide and other gases generated by human activity are responsible. There is no question about it. There is no mistake in the data. The data is, is very clear that human activity is responsible for it. Again, going back to this slide on what we learned from the ice core data, this area, industrialization came on and it trended, trended up. All right, so what do you think happens then? This is a question you can, you can answer. What happens then if this continues to go? Someone please share with me some, some consequences of increased uh, greenhouse gases that affect, which means the temperature goes up, right? What happens next? What happens in our environment? Who's awake? Come on. Yes. Like things will start dying like plants. I'm sorry? Things will start dying off. Start dying off starts at what? Why? Because like 
gets too hot. Yeah, it gets too hot. Maybe it'll start to affect what the organic plant vegetation. It can't handle that those levels of heat. What else? What else might happen? Yeah. The ocean levels rise. The ocean levels rise, and that's critical. And that is happening. And that is the most critical one that's happening right now. But the increase again of you of of heat against simple organic, right? Can 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 cause some problems. Well, that is a huge one, and that's been and it is well documented that the shorelines are depleting. Now, keep in mind, we these are these greenhouse gases are natural. But what's happened? There was a balance that kept the blanket right. So when 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 we when industrialization came in, we started to put more of these in, which increased, caused an increase in temperature. It's like turning up the dial on your um, electric blanket, okay? You're at one temp, you crank it up, you push it up, push the energy in, and it gets warmer. That's, a, that's an analogy to what, that's an analogy to what's happening here. We're putting more green, greenhouse gases into the environment that nature cannot comfortably uh, send through its cycles and keep it balanced. Okay? Why? Because you cannot create nor destroy matter and nature was already balanced. Okay? It didn't have room for anything else. So, in order to help with this, uh, governments from around the world came together and formed what's called the IPCC. And this group has agreed to work on getting better at controlling uh, issues related to uh, global warming, okay, and specifically greenhouse gases. And I'd like for you to know about this group. All right, it's very clear. And this, they, these are the things that they agreed upon. They basically agree that human influence on Earth's climate is clear. Again, there are some who don't believe this and believe it's a conspiracy theory, uh, I hear you, but it is not a conspiracy theory. The data very clear that human uh, influence uh, is affected. And human caused emissions of greenhouse gases are as highest in history. Why do you think it's the highest in history? Not a hard question. Someone tell me why, because that's the type of question I might ask on the exam. Why is it the highest in history? No, go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, like cars, more factories. Yeah, more cars, more factories. You get it? More car, more factory means more greenhouse gases. It is that straightforward. All right? The, the average, when it comes, I'm just using cell phones. By the way, I'm not picking on cell phones. <laughs> I just talk about it as an example. And by the way, I am not an alarmist. So please, don't read any of my comments as alarmist. And my sense of humor by now you recognize is completely dry. Right? Okay? So keep that in mind. But I am not an alarmist. But when it comes to, I'm just going to use cell phone use alone. Most people don't keep a cell phone. At one point, you just keep a cell phone at least three, four, five years. Maybe five years. You might. Now, most cell phone turnovers in a year. Okay, on average. Okay, let the new cell phone come out. You know, you, most a lot of people are going to say, "Well, I'm not," but a lot of people, a lot of people are. That's just how it is. So that's an example. Okay, most electronics aren't don't. Um, uh, don't fall apart, don't wear out, they're usually just traded out. Most of the computers, laptops anymore are traded out. So that's an example of just manufacturing on electronics alone. Follow? So that's what we're talking about. All right, then you have vehicles and the rest of the things that go with manufacturing. Then you have the power, power plants to run this. This is just a consequence of how our lifestyle. Again, this is not an alarmist, but it is a, we have to be aware of it. The other point that we agree upon is that the Human activities, the combustion of fossil fuels, and deforestation, we talked about that in the lecture one, are responsible for atmospheric and ocean warming, lower concentration of ice and snow on the planet, and sea level rising. What happens is sea level, in theory, continues to rise. We'd all have to move to Colorado, right? We'd get rid of all the beaches in Florida. You wouldn't be able to go to spring break in Florida. You'd have to go to Colorado because that would be where the beaches would be. Okay, because that's what happened. The ocean levels rise. The water has to go somewhere to rise up. Again, not an alarmist, but it is no, it is well documented that some beach lines, you know, have receded. You say, well, it's only an inch. Yeah, so that just means that just gives an idea of the rate at which it, it which is moving. Uh, 
I don't think any of us will ever see it come to a height that we could not tolerate, but the future, we not, it's not clear exactly what the future holds, but the trend is not one that's promising. Fortunately, these types of, this, these types of, of agreements, these types of conferences, these types of uh, scientific meetings have helped things to start to not continue to go like this, but kind of slow the curve down, and that's good. Third bullet point, continued emission of greenhouse gas will, reserve, will, will, will result <laughs> in further warming and long-lasting climate changes. And perhaps, you know, human beings and other uh, organic organisms will adjust to that, okay? Will evolve in some fashion to adjust to it, all right? But it won't be a, it won't be a straightforward uh, process. This can cause increased likelihood of other types of things happening to our ecosystem, including to us and including our dogs. So this is how they kind of show the, the picture of what to expect in the future. Um, it's showing that the Arctic um, basic beach line is uh, moving at an alarming rate of 9% per decade. I, won't be, I will not be asking you to remember it's 9%, but I really ask you to remember that it's an alarming rate. That's a pretty good rate. Follow? So this rate, 9%, is an alarming rate. Okay? So if you memorize it's 9%, that's great, but I really like to know it's moving at an alarming rate. 9% is, is huge. Um, as it goes, it creates... The, the, the problem really is it's melting. Okay? When that happens, that can change the temperature of the ocean, and that gets back to some of the animal life in the ocean because the temperature will have changed, and they would have, they would have to evolve. So it's going to certainly affect, affect uh, that. But here's what it's talking about, widening the shipping lanes. That's a pretty interesting thing. That's, that's an industrial statement, right? You have wider, wider, wider shipping lanes. The question is whether that's positive or negative when it come, comes to that. The shipping lanes we, that we're, they're sailing on now are certainly mm -hmm. sufficient to move ships to get to their destinations, all right? So be aware of that, that this is happening and it's going to have an effect on the ocean life and actually, you know, uh, the inland as well. So, here's what we do. We create a new law, right? The Kyoto Protocol is pretty impactful. Uh, establish goals to stabilize or reduce atmospheric greenhouse gases. So that is the goal of the Kyoto Protocol, is to stabilize and reduce atmospheric gases. And it targets some very critical gases that were thought to be, by the agreement of the scientists, to be more uh, destructive or of more concern, mainly because of their use and, the, and, the comp use and composition. Now, there are others. Okay, but these were, were the top, top ones that were targeted. CO2, we comes from what? Uh, burning, right? Complete combustion produced CO2. Comes from manufacturing. If you're running an engine, we're going to produce CO2. Methane comes, uh, there is natural methane. The, so the methane we're talking about is an unhealthy addition. Where does that come from? Oil drilling. So instead of the natural cracks in the earth releasing the methane, when we drill for oil, we create pockets of methane that come out that's unnatural. And now, instead of having this balanced amount of methane in the atmosphere, we get an unhealthy balance of methane. Then NO, the NOx. Where do NOx come from? Everybody knows this by now, right? It comes from manufacturing and vehicles. Got it? For the most part. Then there are other fuel sources. Then we have HFCs. HFCs were alternatives to CFCs. CFCs were the chlorofluorocarbons that replaced refrigerants, ammonia primarily, in refrigerants. And, but what they discovered was that these CFCs, when they ride on the polar winds, they reside, okay, at Antarctica. And it's a really nice laboratory to make chlorine radicals. Those chlorine radicals attack ozone and deplete the ozone layer. And that's happening. Then we have PFCs, which are quite similar to HFCs. And then we have this, our good friend, 
FSF6. FS6, one of the one of the large uses of solutions like this and and like this is to clean cell the, the silicon metal used for electronics to get you your 12 in to get 12 in is etched in these fluoride type type solutions so if you want so that's that's what we pay for for cell phones now i'd like to bring your attention to note does everyone recall what a tetrahedral is say yes right it has a, a center group four species around it and it's a greenhouse gas. If it's tetrahedral, it's a green, in general, particularly 102B, it's a greenhouse gas. If you take an upper level class or you go to graduate school, they'll help sharpen that list for you. Got it? All right. So you have CFCs. They're tetrahedral. This is tetrahedral. This is tetrahedral. This is tetrahedral. You want to be aware of that. CF, CH4 is tetrahedral. HFCS is tetrahedral. PFCS tetrahedral as well. Therefore, they respond as greenhouse gases. Okay? This is how they respond as greenhouse gases. CO2 is linear. And this is on the chart. There's a green chart in chapter 4 that you have to memorize these from. This is a linear linear material. And this one is, is NO2 in the south. Alright. So, be aware that these have shapes that make them susceptible to being greenhouse gases. That is the take home point. So now, so what do you do then? Well, you say, gee, we have to manufacture, we have to drive a vehicle, right? You do want, you know, you want to watch the NCAA tournament, right? So they're going to need basketballs. They're going to need a hoop. They're going to need all these kinds of things that are manufactured, okay? You want to play football. You're going to need a goal pole. Someone's got to dig the metal, get the metal, solder it up, put up a yellow goal post, and watch someone kick it wide right when they're trying to win the game. That's got to happen, okay? So if you want these types of things, then what do you do? What the manufacturer comes to do, they do what's called trade-off credits. For example, I drive a, a, a truck. My truck is not quite as large as I would like for it to be because I have others that ride with me that say if I get a truck like that, they'll never ride with me again. Actually, that's tempting a good reason to get the truck, right? But anyway, I drive a truck. I like driving my truck, which means I plant stuff. I compost. I recycle. That's my trade-off, you follow, for the part of life I like to do. And yes, I like owning a cell phone and an iPad and... More than, more than three or four laptops, several desktops. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the junkie guy. Got it? So I have to go out and plant, right? right? You get it? So that's what the trade-offs are like. I'm just using these examples. That's what industry is doing. If they're high in one area, they're saying, please, go. you have to go low in another. Follow? Now, if the entire industry is high in the area, then they come across the industry and say, everybody has to, has to go down. So we can keep those emissions under control. Uh, should, okay, that brings us to this slide. Essentially, that's what this slide is attempting to show you, is how through these regulations, uh, the manufacturers have agreed to do trade-offs, and they have these values. I do not expect you to memorize these values, but I do expect you to know that all manufacturing is pushed to bring levels down. Okay. All the industries are being pushed to bring the level of emissions down. And that, that was a trade-off. So if they're high, if they, for example, they have to be high in one area, they must go low in another. Okay? And so I don't expect, again, that's what the summary of this slide is. And you survived Chapter 4, folks.